the vibrant streets of 1920s New Orleans beneath the whimsical jazz-filled air of the French Quarter. A ghastly discovery on Ursuline Street unfurled a story of passion, of betrayal, and of grotesque dismemberment and murder. This case and the two that follow it have etched their bloody indelible mark on the storied history of life, crime, and the legacy of punishment in the United States of America. As is true with the most edifying cases from history, the graphic content ahead may be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised. On the unsuspecting afternoon of October 27, 1927, Nettie Compass, resident and cleaner in a French Quarter apartment building, made a ghastly discovery. Entering the second floor apartment at 715 Ursuline Street to tidy what should have been a love-filled family apartment, she first encountered traces of blood and a room in disarray. This was highly unusual and alarming. The sight of blood and disorder in the apartment immediately indicated to Nettie that something was very wrong here. How right she was. Reporting at the time indicates she ran from the scene screaming. Her discovery led two nearby men to investigate the ruckus, who in turn quickly involved the police and coroner, Dr. George F. Rowling. Upon their arrival, authorities found the apartment in disarray, with blood spatters clearly visible in the rear room. Investigators opened a trunk next to a sack of dirty laundry and found the dismembered body of Mrs. Leonid Moiti. Her bloodied bed was in the same room and it seemed likely that she had been asleep when she was mercilessly hacked to death by her murderer. In another room, the children's room, it appears in fact, there against the wall was another foreboding trunk. Investigators approached and opened it. Perhaps not surprising by this point, within the trunk they found the body of Mrs. Teresa Moiti, Henry's wife. Along with her remains was a very large and bloodied weed or cane knife, which likewise had been dismembered. The scene unfurled further. Bloody footprints and even bits of Teresa's fingers were found lying on the blood-soaked mattress in one of the rooms. Both women had been almost expertly amputated at the shoulders. Both had their heads removed and their legs had been torn from their joints. It's hard to imagine a more grisly scene. Cane knives can be a particularly dreadful weapon, and they actually make an appearance in another dreadfully curious video about the bloody history of the Caribbean. Watch for it at the end screen, or click the link in the description below. Police then found another weapon, a lead club covered in leather, or what's referred to as a billy club. This type of blunt weapon was common in this period, owned by police constables and law enforcement, but certainly some in the public as well. Other details emerged upon closer inspection. Teresa's wedding ring was missing, presumably having come off when the killer cut off her fingers. They located the ring, which had been forced into a gaping gash in her back. In the bathroom, they found a tub stained by more than tomato juice and a bloody men's bathroom discarded amongst a scene of bloody disgusting. It didn't take long for suspicion to coalesce around the suspects. Henry Moiti, his wife Teresa, and his brother Joseph Moiti and Joseph's wife, Leonid, along with their young children, all resided together in the small, cramped apartment on Ursuline Street in New Orleans. With both Teresa and Leonid very dead and chopped up in a box, the only other adults in the situation were husbands, Henry and Joseph. Superintendent of Police Thomas Healy ordered the arrest of the Moiti brothers. Joseph Moiti turned himself into police several hours later. Henry Moiti, however, who, by the way, was a butcher by trade, Yikes, eluded capture. It would be four long days post-murder before the law caught up with and arrested Henry. He confessed to the crimes. Henry confessed that he had killed his wife, Teresa, and sister-in-law, Leonid, in a drunken rage propelled by jealousy. His brother, Joseph, had indeed moved out of their French Quarter apartment by that time due to infidelities by Leonid. The way the killer tells it, Teresa approached him that fateful night and told him she was cheating on him and leaving, leaving him and the children. Good riddance to bad rubbish. She supposedly piled on further by stating her intention to go out in the town with her fellow cheater and sister-in-law for some good flirting with other men. It's some time later that night that both women were killed in their beds. Henry then called a cab for his three kiddos who had been in the house this whole time and sent them off to Brother Joseph. In my review of reporting from this time, Henry is called a demon and definitely blamed for the crimes, but actually within a somewhat sympathetic context in some cases. Strange complexes and jealousy beyond the man are offered up as public reasoning for an inexplicable act. Statements from the husband reinforce swirling rumors that Teresa was having an affair with their landlord. Here are some of the killer's own words, even. I did not think of killing my wife, even though I knew of her infidelity, until she said she was leaving me and my children the next morning. I hated her that night, but I loved her every moment up until that hour, and I love her now. She was a beautiful woman. So there you have it. Just a husband and a father who snapped. There's more to this, I think. 
What follows are some of the factors that may have contributed to Henry's crimes. None are an excuse, but some may be a contributing reason. Henry snapped isn't exactly a novel defense. Malice of forethought refers to the intent to kill or cause serious harm before committing the act. It is a fundamental component of first-degree murder charges, indicating that the perpetrator had a conscious intent to end a life. The temporal gap between the alleged provocation and the act itself suggests the presence of cognitive deliberation rather than impulsive action. This interval allowed for the formation of intent, planning, and the execution of the crime, which contradicts any defense of a spontaneous act induced by emotional distress or intoxication. Moving further, the human brain's executive functions include planning, decision-making, and impulse control. A genuine loss of control, snapping, implies a sudden overwhelming failure of these systems. However, the time elapsed between the triggering event and the crime suggests that Moiti had sufficient opportunity for reflection and decision-making, indicating that his executive functions were engaged rather than bypassed. While alcohol can impair judgment and lower inhibitions, its effect on behavior are not universally deterministic. The assertion that alcohol consumption alone led to a loss of control fails to account for the individual's responsibility in managing their actions. Moreover, the methodical nature of the crime indicates a level of coordination and forethought inconsistent with the disorganized behavior typically associated with extreme intoxication. Psychological research distinguishes between effective, reactive, violence driven by an immediate emotional response and predatory or instrumental violence characterized by goal-oriented planned aggression. The meticulous execution of the crime as evidenced by the disposal of the bodies and the cleanup of the crime scene aligns much more closely with predatory violence, again undermining a spontaneous outburst. Here's another factor. A blood-stained rejection slip from a woman's magazine was found at the scene, belonging to Leonid. She had penned a story, thought to be an autobiography of sorts, that warned as to the plight of the female gender during this period and the dangers of marriage. The context of Leonid's story, focusing on finding joy after a failed marriage and warning against the risks of seeking happiness outside societal norms, reflects the complex navigation of personal desires against the backdrop of restrictive gender roles. Her cautionary tale emphasizes the precarious nature of women's pursuit of independence and self-fulfillment in an era where marriage was often viewed as a life sentence, limiting women's autonomy. The Moiti sisters' tragic end in the context of alleged infidelities in terms like careless parenting being touted and thrown around by the tabloid-style press of the era illustrates the severe consequences women faced when perceived as defying societal expectations. I do feel that this complex family dynamic was actually more about Henry and Joseph's disdain for their wives violating social norms. This was male aggression. Overall, the deliberate nature of the crime, the use of skills related to his profession as a butcher, and the steps taken to conceal his actions all paint a level of premeditation that contradicts a defense of impulsivity. Moreover, the role of gender in oppressive societal norms cannot be overstated. Now, on to the fate of Mr. Henry Moiti. The wife-murdering dirtbag or possessed demon, depending on who you'd ask, was convicted of double murder. Unlike the killers in the stories coming up, Henry was spared the sentence of death. Instead, two consecutive life sentences. Well, sort of. Henry was a model prisoner for 16 years and was granted trustee status as a convict. In a not at all daring and only slightly clever escape, he became a fugitive during an unsupervised but approved visit to the post office. Nice. On the run for over a year, he was captured in California and sent back to the welcoming Louisiana prison system to serve out the remainder of his natural life. But the twisty turny fate of Henry Moiti has yet another twisty turn in store. In a baffling and not at all expected move, State Governor Jimmy Davis pardoned Henry. He was free again. But of course not for long. Henry, some years later, shot his girlfriend and was again confined to prison, where he died of a stroke in 1957. But let's not end this case on the killer. This is about Teresa and Leonid Moiti, women woven into the fabric of New Orleans through the whispers of history and a wee bit of penny dreadful satire. Leonid's unpublished manuscript, a heart-wrenching narrative of love and loss, offers a glimpse into the sisters' inner worlds, overshadowed by infidelity and the harsh realities of their existence. Their tragic and misunderstood end casts a shadow over not just the quarter, but also touches the blood-soaked suffrage of an American nation. In the early 20th century, a chilling case of true crime unfolded along the railways that built America. The railroads of the United States once served as arteries of progress, pulsating with the lifeblood of an era marked by rapid industrial growth and the relentless pursuit of the American dream. 
this vast network of steel and steam connected distant corners of the country, weaving through the rugged landscapes of the mountain west, where states like Utah and Colorado were nestled amongst the towering peaks and desert expanses. For many, the railways symbolize the march towards a more modern future, a testament to human ingenuity and the underlying spirit of exploration and expansion. Yet beneath the gleaming facade of progress, the rail system harbored a more morbid reality for some. It became a stage for the darker elements of society, where tales of crime and desperation unfolded in the shadow of the nation's burgeoning optimism. The case of Henry C. Hett, alias George Allen, epitomizes this dichotomy. This case ends in front of a firing squad in Utah, but its beginnings were in Colorado on November 14, 1922. Henry Hett and his younger brother, after being released from a Colorado Springs jail for vagrancy, teamed up with pal and fellow criminal Arthur Hayes. They then robbed a young man in Pueblo, Colorado, stealing his overcoat and watch. The trio continued their crime spree with the assault and robbery of a drunk person, stealing $5 from him. They were later confronted by two officers in the Pueblo Railroad Yards as they attempted to board a westbound train. Hett escalates the situation by climbing atop a railroad car, and while his accomplices are being handcuffed, he disrupts the arrest by holding the officers at gunpoint from his elevated position. Hett orders Hayes to disarm the officers, the guns are discarded, and the trio forces the officers to march through the railroad yards. One officer attempted to resist, prompting Hett to fire a warning shot, which inadvertently triggers a shell-shocked response in one of the men, a war veteran, causing him to collapse unconscious. The captured officers are then subjected to further humiliation and danger. One is locked in a lumber car, and the other is confined to a refrigerator car's ice compartment, showcasing Hett's callous disregard for human life. The criminals proceed to Salt Lake City in stages, abandoning the train for a haystack hideout at one point. In Cannon City, Hett displays his ruthlessness once more by forcing an officer off a car at gunpoint. Prior to their arrival in Salt Lake City, the guns and stolen items are mailed ahead, conveniently clever. Hett arrives in the city on November 24, 1922, retrieves the mailed items, and plans a rendezvous with Hayes. The pair's criminal activities in Salt Lake City include an attempted robbery involving a white woman and a black man in a car, which is thwarted when the driver crashes into a streetcar, allowing the criminals to escape. This crew was really tearing through the people and places of the Mountain West. Then, on November 27, 1922, the fatal encounter occurs. Hett and an associate are wandering the streets and are confronted by Sergeant Pierce and Patrolman G.F. Watson. Police. Hett responds to Pierce's commands to stop by shooting the officer, leading to Pierce's death much later in March of 1923. Following the shooting, Hett brutally assaults Watson, steals his gun, and flees. He and Hayes are arrested the next day with the stolen overcoat and guns discovered hidden under a platform, leading to their capture. Hett's own confessions and subsequent trial painted a vivid picture of a man steeped in criminal endeavors. So what made this killer kill? It's a good question. The early 1920s in America were a time of rapid industrialization and social change, but also of significant economic disparity. Some individuals struggling with poverty or unemployment might have viewed crime as a desperate means of survival or a way to assert control in a society where they felt powerless. Hett being arrested for vagrancy and known instances of him begging for money serve as clear indicators of socioeconomic pressures playing a significant role in his life. The arrest for vagrancy highlights a lack of stable residence or a means of support, reflecting the broader issues of economic hardship. During the early 20th century, vagrancy laws were often used to criminalize the state of being homeless or jobless, affecting those who are most vulnerable in society. For Hett, this arrest could be seen as a manifestation of socioeconomic struggles, making him someone living on the margins of society. Another possibility. For some, the thrill of evading law enforcement and living outside the boundaries of law and order becomes a driving force. It's not so much thrill by choice, but rather by choice and circumstances. It's a cascading cycle of behavior that can build upon itself. The series of events leading up to the murder, including the daring escape in Colorado, riding the rails like an outlaw on the subsequent journey to Utah, indicate that Hett may have been driven, in part, by the simple rush of criminal activity. Found guilty, Hett was sentenced to death by firing squad. The use of firing squads as a method of execution has a long and varied history across different cultures and time periods. Historically, it has been most commonly used by military organizations for the execution of soldiers, particularly for crimes such as desertion, espionage, or mutiny. However, civilian courts have also employed firing squads for capital punishment. 
Here are some key points about the historical use of firing squads. Various countries and cultures have used firing squads for executions throughout history. While prevalent in military contexts, it also has been used for civilians under certain legal systems. Countries in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and of course the United States have all documented use of firing squads at different points in their histories. Firing squads associated with military justice were at times considered a more honorable death for soldiers, as it allowed them to face their execution standing, and in some cases, with a blindfold symbolizing bravery. The traditional firing squad execution involves a group of soldiers or law enforcement officers aiming their rifles at the condemned individual, typically at the heart to ensure a quick death. Often, one or more of the guns may be loaded with a blank cartridge, allowing each member of the firing squad to maintain uncertainty about whether their shot was the fatal one, thus reducing individual feelings of guilt. In the United States, firing squads have been used sparingly compared to other methods such as hanging, the electric chair, or lethal injection. However, states like Utah have a historical connection to this method. Utah's use of the firing squad is partially attributed to the influence of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS Church, with early church leaders expressing a preference for it based on theological beliefs related to atonement through bloodshed. In the modern era, the use of firing squads has become increasingly rare, with most countries moving towards other methods of execution or abolishing the death penalty altogether. However, the method is still maintained as an option in a few jurisdictions, primarily due to concerns about the availability and humaneness of other methods. The discussion around firing squads continues to be part of the broader debate on capital punishment and its moral, legal, and ethical implications. Historically, firing squads were seen as a more efficient and in some ways more humane method of execution, assuming the executioners were well trained and the procedure was carried out properly, leading to a quick and relatively painless death. However, like all forms of capital punishment, it is subject to significant ethical debates and concerns about potential for suffering. Despite appeals for clemency and a plea to the State Board of Pardons, Henry C. Hett, alias George Allen, was executed on February 20, 1925 at Utah State Prison. The execution took place in the prison yard promptly at 7.45 a.m. It was carried out by a firing squad, a method that, while rare, has historically been used in Utah. Hett was pronounced dead two minutes and five seconds after the firing squad completed their work. This detail suggests the execution was efficiently carried out, leading to Hett's rapid death. He was 23 years old at the time of his execution. The American railroads provide context to this case, cutting through the wilderness and embodying humanity's relentless pursuit of progress and connection. Yet they also underscore the solitude and challenges of life in the American West. This terrain, with its beauty and hostility, amidst the sprawling network of rails that bind the vast expanses of the American frontier, emphasizes the hardships and solitude faced by Head and other killers like him. His case reminds us that ideas of fate and freedom often bring with them the gritty, grim reality of punishment and death. In 1927, Amongst the glamour and affluence of the New York City suburbs, a ghastly tale, as American as it was bloody, unfolded, shrouded in the shadowy fog of money, lust, and American vanity. Albert Snyder, art director for Motorboat Magazine, was found dead in his home, blood and brain matter corrupting his once serene domestic sanctuary of comfort. Mr. Snyder had been bashed in the head repeatedly with a lead sash weight. He'd then been strangled to death with a picture wire. Ruth Snyder, spouse and now widow to Albert Snyder, had been tied up and restrained in the hallway during a very violent robbery. Mrs. Ruth Snyder described an incredible ordeal, being brutalized and tied up by a pair of giant Italian perpetrators who killed her husband during the course of a grisly robbery. The family's home, once a place of peaceful order, had been ransacked and bloodied. If you're already doubting the wife's claims about what happened, you're not alone. March 20, 1927 was going to be a seemingly mundane day. Veiled by smog of industrial progress and the seductive rhythms of jazz, Ruth Snyder, a wife ensnared in the throes of an affair in the pursuit of opulence, found herself executing a murder plot. Her partner in crime, Jed Gray, a corset salesman who'd been ensnared by what reporting of the time might lead you to believe were Ruth's manipulative charms. Through her influence and his own avaricious inclinations, Mr. Gray became an accomplice in the scheme of murder. The duo's nefarious plot to murder Ruth's husband, Albert Snyder, was a macabre dance of deceit and betrayal. 
Albert, unsuspecting, became the tragic linchpin in a plan that promised liberation from marital shackles and a gateway to financial stability. The murder, executed with a chilling blend of clumsiness and brutality, was not just an act of violence, but a declaration of defiance against societal norms and the suffocating grip of a loveless marriage. Albert Snyder was asleep in his bed that early March morning, unaware of the fate that approached him. Ruth and Judd, having prepared their plan with a grim attention to detail, first bludgeoned him with a metal sash weight, seeking to concuss and immobilize their target. They then used picture wire to strangle Mr. Snyder, killing him. Then came the steps of staging a robbery gone wrong. In a heartbreaking twist, Ruth and Judd carried out their plan while nine-year-old Lorraine, child to Ruth and Albert, slept in a room across the hall. While Lorraine was unharmed physically, that is a small mercy in the midst of such a tragic and violent event. The psychological and emotional impacts of her father's murder, and as we'll soon see, her mother's involvement would undoubtedly have been profound. The case's sensational nature and the public scrutiny that followed only added to the difficulties faced by those caught in the wake of the crime, especially a young child like Lorraine. As news of the crime seeped through the city's consciousness, it became a sensational spectacle, feeding the public's voracious appetite for scandal. Ruth Snyder was transformed from a victimized suburban housewife into a bloody blonde, emblematic of the era's darkest impulses. She captivated and horrified in equal measure. Her story about the giant Italians was not believed. Her true motives and her unfaithfulness to her husband quickly came to very public light. Ruth Snyder and Jed Gray were defended by separate attorneys. The prosecution presented evidence of their love affair and detailed planning that went into the murder, painting a picture of premeditation and financial motive. You see, Ruth Snyder had taken out several life insurance policies on her husband, including a double indemnity clause that would pay out more if his death was accidental or incidental to another's criminal activity. This financial incentive was a critical piece of evidence in the case, as it highlighted a clear motive for the murder Ruth and Judd stood to gain significantly from Albert Snyder's death. Ruth was also tied up by Judd Gray to bolster this fabricated story, intending for her to be found and appear as another victim of the supposed burglars. This staging was crucial for their initial plan because if the authorities believed the murder was incidental to a burglary, the investigation might not delve deeply into personal relationships or motives that could lead back to Ruth and Judd. Additionally, making Albert's death appear accidental or related to a criminal act by unknown parties was essential for triggering the double indemnity clause of the life insurance policy, which promised a larger payout in the event of an accidental death. However, their efforts to create a believable scene of a robbery gone wrong quickly fell apart under police scrutiny. Investigators found inconsistencies in their story and physical evidence that contradicted their account of events, leading to their arrest and prosecution for the murder of Albert Snyder. If we're not careful here, this would be about when we had oversimplified murder for love and greed. But there's something deeper here, I think. The 1920s were a time of significant social change, particularly regarding women's roles in society. The aftermath of World War I and the advent of the suffrage movement led to greater freedoms for women, but also to societal anxiety about these changing roles. Bruce Snyder's case was sensationalized in part because she defied the traditional roles expected of women, engaging in an extramarital affair and plotting her husband's murder. Now, plotting an actual murder isn't cool and rarely ages well. However, the pressures and limitations faced by women during this era, more than likely, contributed to Ruth's actions. During this period, obtaining a divorce could be a difficult and lengthy process requiring substantial legal and financial resources. Women, in particular, faced challenges in the legal system that was often biased against them. For example, proving grounds for divorce, such as cruelty or adultery, was difficult and could subject the women to public scandal and personal humiliation. Divorce also carried with it a significant social stigma, particularly for women. Divorced women were often viewed with suspicion and could be ostracized by society. This stigma could impact a woman's social standing, her relationships, and her opportunities for remarriage. The challenges of obtaining a divorce and the social stigma associated with being divorced had profound implications for women who were unhappy in their marriages. For many, remaining in an unsatisfactory or even abusive marriage might have seemed the only viable option due to economic dependency, fear of social ostracism, and concern for their children's well-being. The difficulty of achieving economic independence and the social stigma attached to divorce could dissuade many from even considering it. Another factor in this case, the narrative surrounding Ruth Snyder's role in the murder emphasizes the complex interplay between gender perceptions, media influence, and legal proceedings of the time. 
Ruth was depicted as both a victim and a symbol of the dangers posed by the perceived liberation of women in the 1920s. Her case served as a battleground for debates over gender roles, with the media playing a crucial role in shaping the narrative and public opinion. The press applied pressures that, make no mistake, influenced the supposed blindness of justice in this case. The defense attempted to argue for the innocence of their clients. This included blaming each other for the murder itself. But the overwhelming evidence and the pressures of public sentiment against both of the accused made those efforts futile. Bruce Snyder and Jed Gray were both convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. The outcome was unsurprising given the nature of the crime, the evidence presented at trial, and the public and legal attitudes towards capital punishment at the time. Bruce Snyder and Judd Gray were both executed on January 12, 1928 at Sing Sing Prison in New York. The method of execution was electrocution. The electric chair was commonly used in New York and other states during this period for carrying out death sentences. Let's zoom in a bit on this particularly horrible fate of electrocution. The method of capital punishment by electrocution, which was used for the executions of Ruth Snyder and Judd Gray, operates on the principle of passing a large electric current through the body of the condemned individual. This method was introduced as a supposed humane alternative to hanging in the late 19th century. The scientific reasoning behind electrocution as a means of execution is based on an immediate and severe disruption of the body's vital functions, leading to death. The primary cause of death in electrocutions is typically cardiac arrest. The electric current applied to the body disrupts the electrical signals in the heart, leading to an immediate stoppage of heart function. In theory, that is. Additionally, the electric current can cause paralysis of the respiratory system, leading to cessation of breathing. Other impacts occur as high voltage causes extensive damage to tissues and organs, including severe burns at the points of contact, where the electrodes are attached to the body, and potentially through the entire body due to the current's path. The application of high voltage electric current is intended to cause death quickly and theoretically with less pain than other methods available at the time. The idea is that the disruption of heart function and central nervous system leads to unconsciousness and death so rapidly the person does not suffer. The voltage and duration of the electric current are calculated to ensure that death is instantaneous and certain, though variations in human physiology can affect the execution's outcome. This mode of execution wasn't always something that went according to plan. Electrocution can cause severe physical trauma, including burning of the skin and internal organs and forceful contraction of muscles. These effects can be distressing to witness and raise ethical questions about the method's humanity. There have been several documented cases where executions by electrocution have gone terribly, horribly wrong, leading to prolonged deaths, suffering, and significant distress for witnesses. These botched executions have contributed to the ongoing debate over the use of the electric chair and the ethical implications of capital punishment in general. In 1999, for instance, Alan Lee Davis was executed by the state of Florida in an electric chair known as Old Sparky. The execution was particularly gruesome. Davis suffered severe burns, and photographs showed his body covered in blood, which had poured from his mouth during the execution. This isn't guaranteed to be a painless way to go. Not at all. Back to the case. Judd Gray was executed first. He reportedly smiled when the time came. His wife, you see, had just forgiven him for adultery, murder, or both wasn't clear or specified. Interesting. The switch was flipped, and Mr. Judd Gray was electrocuted to death. Ruth, awaiting the same fate, watched the lights in her cell flicker as her lover's life was extinguished by the state of New York. Just minutes after Judd's electrocution, Ruth was escorted to the death chamber. In the shadow of the electric chair, Ruth Snyder's final moments were immortalized in a flashbulb's glare, a haunting image that seared the collective memory. A reporter had strapped a camera to his leg and smuggled it in to the death chamber, capturing a captivating moment of human death and punishment. The image depicts electricity coursing through the convulsing body of convicted murderer Mrs. Ruth Snyder at the time of death. In the shame-soaked pages of American Crime and Punishment, this real case from history offers lessons on love, greed, and the relentless pursuit of freedom at any cost. <laughs>